Okay, everybody. Welcome once again to Radio Dead Air Tech Q and A. You've got questions. We've got guesses. Um, I am Nash. I do RDA, and I have over a decade's worth of experience with fiddly electronic -y thingies. And uh, my producer, Mike Gearman, there was hello. Similar bona fide finals. People are remarking the fact that you're you're there's less of you to love. Yeah, yeah. What happened? Didn't grow back. I, I was, I was, I was trimming it, and then okay, I got a little uneven. Okay, I got a little uneven, and I said, now back, and it just seriously. Got out of hand. Did you did you seriously? It got out of hand. It's just easier to take it all the way down and just start over. <laughs> I didn't take it all the way off. You know. <laughs> it got a lot. Of <laughs> One thing led to another. Before you know it, it's, it's, there's a there's a Marx Brothers movie where there's stowaways <laughs> on a boat, and at one point I think it was Harpo and Chico passing themselves off as the ship's barbers, and the ship officer comes up to get a mustache trim, and they go. Oh, it's a little uneven. Take one stoop off this side, and they keep going back and forth, alternating sides, until he's got no mustache left. <laughs> well, I, I will grant you this: it is even now. That that is a true. Oh my God! All right, <laughs> it got a little out of hand. <laughs> That's like the excuse people use when they're like, you know, arrested for a fight in a bar. It got a little out. Only it's your beard. It got a little out of hand. I don't know what to say. <laughs> uh, well, we've got uh, your questions tonight. <laughs> um, now, if there's something you'd like to ask us here at uh, Tech Q&A. Send your questions to requests at radio.air.com. We will endeavor to put those on and see if we can find something resembling a solution to your problems. But uh, we're going to start off, da -da -da -da, start off with a little bit of news. And I think the first news story I want to hit is kind of a security alert. Ah, uh, yes. Now, I want to be really clear before we start talking about the story. Um, we are still kind of in the dark about what the fuck is going on here. We have the company's version of what's happening and the end user's versions of what ha what's happening. Nothing is very certain, especially considering the company's PR on this has been shit. It's just been awful. So let's let's get to this. Or phenomenal, depending on how you look at it. Um... Lots of you out there may have made use of a piece of tech called TeamViewer. TeamViewer is a nice little piece of software that is, I, I, I essentially call it the grandma button. Yes, it's remote access software. Right. So when your grandmother calls you up and asks you why her printer's not working, instead of trying to walk her through every single troubleshooting step, and spend the next 10 hours of your life wishing your soul could escape your body and flee to the heavens. That's what team, that's where TeamViewer comes in. TeamViewer is a free uh, remote access software. You install a copy on your system, you install a copy on grandma's system. So when she calls you up, and I say grandma, you can substitute whichever relative, grandpa, uncle, whichever one does not Mother, know. father brother sister yeah whichever member of your family there is that member of your family who always calls you who does not know how to use a fucking thing on the computer what you do is you have a copy of team viewer they have a copy of team viewer you press a button and it connects to their computer and suddenly your mouse is moving their mouse you type, it appears on their screen, and you're able to see and access everything on their computer. And fix their printer quickly in, in five minutes rather than, no, no, you double click, no, don't, no, go, no, just go back, go back screen. 
instead of doing all that shit for 20 minutes. No, 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 illegal operation. No, 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 no. Stop crying. You're not going to be arrested. Stop crying. Stop crying. No, I don't know what PC load letter means either. Stop crying. Um. Now, for a while, TeamViewer was fairly secure. Basically, one of those security by obscurity things. How it worked was your computer was assigned a randomized set of numbers with a unique password. This ch could change, you could change it with the click of a button. You could assign it to use one name and one password for a single session. That means after that other person connected and remoted into your computer and you hit disconnect, they would not be able to get back into your computer because that password and that name only worked one time. That worked fairly secure. That that was a fairly secure way of doing it. Yeah, it's hard hard to uh, take advantage of it. Changes every time you use it. Then TeamViewer, someone in the marketing department thought, "Hey, let's start offering TeamViewer accounts," <sighs> which is you could log into TeamViewer with your email address and a password that never changed, that was never randomized, and you could use it every single time you logged into your, from anywhere. Convenient? Sure. Insecure? Fuck yes. And that well, is- so Potentially insecure. It depends on how well, how secure they kept that information. If they kept it in a, in a encrypted database where the passwords and, are, and, and information is hashed properly, then it could be very secure. But the guess right now is maybe they didn't, or maybe the communication between your console and their server is not secure, so people can sit on the network and sniff it or something like that. And that's where we are right now with thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people affected right now. We're not entirely sure because no one's entirely sure. That's how crazy the story is. Thousands of people have been affected by this. Users are reporting that random computers they don't know, a lot of them who have IP addresses originating in China, are logging into their computers, looking into their password lists that are in their browser, their saved passwords, going into their PayPal accounts, their bank accounts, taking money. And just and, taking everything. And just taking and stealing all the credit card numbers and all that shit. And just or, ordering a bunch of shit off Amazon. Yep, yep. Uh, and so far, like I say, no one knows exactly how they've done this. So team viewers saying, well, it's we don't think it's us. Obviously, someone out there is doing something insecure. Now, if it was just one person, you could say, okay, maybe this one guy got hacked and they got into his stuff and they use TeamViewer to do it. But when it starts being thousands, we're like, these people have one thing in common. Team, well, two things in common, Windows operating system and TeamViewer, but. Well, no, not just Windows. This is affecting other operating systems too that use TeamViewer. TeamViewer runs on Mac, TeamViewer runs on Linux. It's not just uh. Windows. So, what TeamViewer essentially said was when these reports started coming in, was uh, they foisted, they passed the buck. They said, obviously, this is a problem with people reusing passwords. These are insecure passwords. Now, what they mean by this is they're, they're connecting this to um, a couple of notable password dumps that have hit recently, yes. those being LinkedIn and Tumblr. Those were hacked back in, I think it was 2012 or something? 2012, LinkedIn was hacked, and it's 117 million yeah no it can't be that not that but a, 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 a lot. high number 17 million maybe and uh the same with with tumblr a lot of their passwords why that's popping up now is people have decrypted those passwords and they're selling them on the the dark web on the tours on the the, the illegal nasty ooh sticky parts of the internet yes and uh so what happened? There was there. There've been previous password leaks that have been as large. For example, there was Adobe. a MySpace password leak yep. years ago. But the reason the MySpace password leak wasn't as big a deal is because MySpace, unbeknownst to anyone but people at MySpace, you have a 15-character password. They're truncating it down to about 10 characters and shifting it to all lowercase. So it really wasn't useful for saying this 
this password will get me into other stuff because other places weren't doing that. Um, uh, but it's, it's now what yeah, seven million accounts. What team viewer is saying is, well, obviously what happened is some users out there have reused their passwords from these older accounts. They've never changed them. And that's the vector hackers are using to get into team viewer. It's mm. not us. Which would hold up if they weren't using TeamViewer as the platform. Well, not just that. Some users have been reporting that not only were they using passwords, they were using two factor authentication. Again, these are unsubstantiated reports, but there have been a lot of them. And what two-factor authentication means is if you've we've, we've talked about this before if say you're playing an mmo like uh world of warcraft um they require two-factor authentication you have your username your password and then say a smartphone app or a little keychain dongly thing that gives you an extra set of numbers what that yeah and the way for example the way uh, warcraft does it they don't make you do that second factor they don't, don't make you do that second factor every time, just if your IP address changes. So if I'm at home, I don't have to put in that thing every time I... He's leaving on a midnight train to Georgia. Yeah, screw that. I've been to Georgia. Thank you very much. <laughs> Continue, Mike. Sorry. Uh, they don't make you log in uh, with that extra extra ID number every time, which the way their app works, it changes every like 10 seconds. Uh, but they say, oh, you changed your IP address. You're logging in from a different location. Prove you're you. Do the extra step. Now, in most cases, in just about virtually 99% of the time, two-factor authentication is completely secure. Unless it's done badly. Yeah. Two-factor authentication can fail when there's a security hole in the software that's enabling the two-factor authentication in the first place. So these people who are reporting that their two-factor authentication accounts on TeamViewer have been hacked, what that would mean is there is an underlying security flaw in TeamViewer. This possible. could, that is a serious big bad considering TeamViewer is widely used mainly for one big reason. It's free for non-commercial use, which means it's free. We'll just kind of not tell the auditors that we're using it on our company system because who needs to know? <laughs> um, so it's, it's used quite widely across the internet, across commercial businesses, home users, it's it's a very popular remote access software. And considering it's remote access software, it's it's one of the most serious, I mean, that that's your computer. They own your fucking computer. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's getting in, and since the purpose of it is to get in there and do troubleshooting primarily, uh, it's likely in there with admin credentials. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because they could also download all sorts of other things to your computer and add on stuff. So you go, oh, I've changed all my passwords. Yes, but you did it while we were here, so we have all those too. And TeamViewer also has file transfers. So if you have any photos or videos or things you don't want getting out there, fuck they've, that. They've got your porn. They've got your porn. So what's the true story here? Is TeamViewer right in saying that people have been reusing passwords and they're insecure? Maybe are the I suspect users, it'll be another week or two before we find out for sure. Are the users right and saying that, oh, well, no, there's something seriously going on here because I was using two-factor authentication? Maybe, but I'll tell you what TeamViewer has not done yet. Something that every other company who's faced a hack like this has done, which is force a password reset. Yeah, that's, that's a bad idea on... That not to do that on their part. TeamViewer, the minute this started being reporting, should have said, look, your password may be compromised. They should have emailed everyone with a TeamViewer account and said, 
your password may have been compromised. If you're using TeamViewer and you have a TeamViewer account, I've checked my spam file, I've checked my email, I've checked everywhere. I have received no notification of a potential security issue. I mean, I got, when, when Ars Technica, the tech website got hacked, mm -hmm. and they were 99% certain that they got hashed password values but didn't get the hash key or anything like that, they said, you know what, reset your password anyway. Yeah, um, when, when when I think when Tumblr got hacked, it forced a password reset. It didn't even give users the option to change their password. It said, look, we're resetting all your passwords. Go and change it right now. Here you go. Go change it. You have to do that if you want to continue to log in. Change your password immediately. Follow this link. We won't let you in without it. Now, some people probably change their password to the same thing they previously had, but... But still, the, the company took that step, which is a very small and basic step. The fact that TeamViewer is not taking this step is really bad on their part. So, since we do not know what the hell is going on with TeamViewer, my best recommendation, and since they have been, they fumbled this from a PR perspective so badly, so I had to find out from the news that this was going on. I'm a team viewer user and I had to find out from the fucking news. No, I should have been emailed about this. So my best response, if you use team viewer, uninstall it immediately until we find out what's going on until team viewer addresses this until there is a better response from the company. I don't feel safe having it on my computer, and at the moment, neither should you. I would get it. Now, if you need some sort of replacement, sorry, I really can't help you. There is a Chrome uh, app that does a similar remote desktop option. You can look into that. Some people still use, uh, um, I just lost it. Um, Let me in? No, no. Um, Let me in bad. Uh, some people still use Windows Remote Desktop. Yeah, we, yeah. Um, but in in any case, what I would say right now is, you just for the time being, until we get more information about this, get it off your system to be safe. And on if you are using TeamViewer, I would also recommend check your PayPal statements, check your bank statements, check all of your financial because that's what these people have been going after. Yeah. By the reports. And be ready to protest if you see things you do not recognize. Yeah. Go go and look on your financial statements. Go see if there's any weird charges. Go see if anything's out of the ordinary. Go do it right now. This this is this even if it, even if think, oh, this is only like a two dollar charge. I don't remember this, but what is this? Because what what a lot of times hackers will do when they get a number is they will test it out with a low charge to see if the account is good and yeah. if someone notices. Yeah. And if you go, oh, I charged a dollar. They didn't do anything. No one protested, got the dollar. Charge two dollars. Okay, they didn't do anything. No one noticed. Ten dollars. They hit you for little bits over time. Some, that, the smarter ones, hit you for little bits over time yeah. rather than clean out everything at once. Let's move on to Intel. Intel's enthusiast series of processors, um, the E-series. I forget what they mean by enthusiast. They mean people with more money than brains. Ah. Or power users in some cases. Um, the uh, Broadwell E-series, the latest iteration, has been released and we have uh, we have Specs? benchmarks oh, for, for the Broadwell E-series. Yay! Here's the problem. Let's start off up front. We've, we talked, a, I think we've touched on this a little bit before. Intel's Broadwell E i7-6950X is the world's first consumer 10-core processor. And it is expensive as hell. It is, that, eh, we're going to get to that. It is ridiculously expensive. Now, the previous high-end was the 8-core 5960X. 
That was released in, uh, I believe, 2014, 2015? It's 2014. So, yeah, not yeah, that. It's only a year or two old. <clears throat> and that retailed for approximately $1,000. Yeah. Which is on the high end. Keep in mind, that $1,000 is just for the CPU, not for a motherboard, not for RAM, not for the entire computer, just the little chip that makes the whole thing run, $1,000. But it was an eight core processor, so, you know, it was a yeah. big deal. The previous one on that was a six core processor. That one retailed for $1,000. The high end now is the 10 core processor, retails, for seventeen hundred dollars, i.e., expensive as hell. Seventeen hundred, just for the CPU. And I'll be honest. Okay, so that's a what twenty five percent increase in cores. Yeah. And a one hundred percent. Increase in price. 90, 80% increase. Yeah, about 80% increase in price for a 25% increase in power. Is it, is it a different manufacturing standards? You know, scale? Um, it is the years. new, it is the newer, smaller. It is a die shrink. So I think they went from 22 to 14. So they got to pay off the die shrink factory first. Now, there is one just below the 6950X, which is the 6900K. That one is an eight core processor, like the previous reigning predecessor, uh, you, know, you know. Before we go any further, yeah. do we have any understanding of how Intel numbers and names their things? No. No, we don't. They just put fucking numbers together and they're confusing as shit. And that it just it's slightly higher numbers is all I can tell. The new generation of eight core processor, as opposed to the one before it, you would think since before the six core processor was the high end, it was a thousand. The eight core processor was the high end, it was a thousand. Now a comparable eight core processor is eleven hundred. It's slightly faster, three point two gigahertz versus three. Yeah. I, I, that's for another numbers. hundred, but let's get to the benchmarks. Certainly. And I'm not even looking at gaming performance here. These are... What the, your gaming performance is going to be off on the GPU anyway. This is the Windows performance. Now, I know we're getting a little wonky on here, but let's just... Here's all you need to know. I wish the fucking bandwidth would, would level out because this is fucking driving me crazy tonight. Here's all you really need to know. Um, over here on this chart, this great big chart, um, I don't know how well people can see it. I might just make put this up on the big screen. Great big screen. Great big screen. There we go. They can't see us, but they can see this chart. That's what we need. Okay, so we're looking at the numbers here. And what they bear out is... Um, let, let's give you an example. Let's go with the... Uh, 4960X. Sure. Now, that one was released in 2012, 2013, I believe. So that's a two, three-year-old three, three year old CPU right now. It was $1,000 at release. And let's look at the Cinebench single-thread uh, benchmark. Um, where higher is better on this benchmark. Uh, it completes a task in 144 seconds. Okay. Okay, that, that's that's the 4960X. The net, the one that was released the year after that, completed it. Well, it's okay, well, it's not all right, we're not talking in seconds, but the score higher is higher score is better. So the older one does 144. The next newest one did it in 140, so it was actually slower on this test. And the most current one comes in with a score of 146. That's only single threaded, but that's only, that's not a very big increase. Now let's look at multi-thread. 
the 5960X starts to stand out a little bit better. You can see here oh, yeah. it's, it's it's at the top. It, it, it's at the absolute top of this. But if you look over the as it as it kind of should be. But if you look at the increases over, let's see, the 5960X over the 40, not nah, the increases aren't all that great. Yeah, you get a 50% increase off the 5960X. 50% increase with an 80% price increase now what we're breaking down here is because everyone here is going what do all these numbers mean i don't understand this is talking about intel's performance while they keep they they add these claimed features that will increase speed and increase performance in the processors is doing so in such tiny increments as to be meaningless and not only that, they're increasing the price way out of proportion to the actual gains in performance. Now, lots of people here are saying, well, it's a 10 core processor. It's the first consumer 10 core processor. But there have been enterprise and business 10 core processors for a long time. That's the Xeon line. That, that's Intel's high level. You can get a Xeon for around $923. That is a 10-core Xeon. New. Now, it's slower than this one. I, I, I believe we're talking a difference of... Um, it's like 2.5 gigahertz as opposed to this one is... 3.0 gigahertz, so it is a slower processor. However, the Xeon also is one of the, as a nice feature, it enables you to use two CPUs. You can double socket Xeons, which gives you a grand total of 20 cores for about the same price as this consumer 10 core processor. Where does this all come from? So. If you're a consumer, if you're an enthusiast, if you're a gamer, a 10-core processor isn't going to give you much of anything because, yeah. well, most games barely use, most PCs have four cores, and most games barely use four cores. So you're not going to see any, pri any performance increase there. All your performance increases off your graphics card. And if you're someone like me, who does video editing and live streaming with their system, who needs a home workstation. First of all, I'm using a six core processor from the 4930K from a couple of years ago. I have been given no incentive here to upgrade. Because you, well, your, your processor is not your bottom neck. Right, and it's still, and these processors are not that much faster than what I'm already using. Besides, if I upgraded my processor, I'd have to upgrade my motherboard, my memory. It would be a way too expensive to justify the, the, the performance increase that is incremental. And if I absolutely needed 10 cores, a much cheaper alternative would be for me to purchase an Intel Xeon. So my... Absolute, my question is, who is this processor for? It's not for the ultra professionals. It's not for gamers. It's not for anybody. There are cheaper and more efficient alternatives to the 6950X at every turn for people who need to either get real work done or are just interested in using their computer for entertainment. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest, I can't think of a a specific use for 10 core yeah. maybe someone who's doing a lot of cad stuff but even then i wouldn't think if this 10 core was priced maybe 1200 maybe even a thousand because that has been shown as as the what the market will tolerate for the high end a thousand has been what the market will tolerate for high-end cpu if it were closer to a thousand dollars i can see a justification for it that would be a fine yeah drop-in upgrade for a lot of home workstations, but not at $1,700. That's the price of an entire workstation right there by itself. 
what all this shows, and I know I'm rambling about this quite a bit, but what all this shows is this is Intel minus AMD. Yeah. You can see the year-to-year -year performance being incremental. The year-to-year -year performance upgrades being incremental. You can see the prices rising well past what's actually worth investing in. They have no competition. They have no reason to compete. They can price them however they want. Whether anyone will buy them. I mean, the only, the only way people would buy, I think, this processor in any sort of bulk is if they discontinued most of the others. Yeah. Either that or bragging rights. That's the only reason to get a 6950X is bragging rights. It's a completely impractical processor, both in terms of the actual performance increases it offers or the price of it. It's it's who is this thing for? Just to say you've got one? You're an idiot. It might well be. You're a fucking idiot. Or management. Eh. So now this is this is starting to show us what happens in this marketplace when one company has the lion's share. Let's be honest, they own Intel right now owns the desktop server market, the desktop workstation server that all belongs to Intel right now. In, in the same way that, you know, uh, NVIDIA owns the video. That Which brings, is a wonderful that, seg into our next story. That exactly is that. Now, <laughs> for the longest time, again, this is an AMD problem. For the longest time, AMD has been dying in the CPU range and also dying in the graphics processor range when it comes to making graphics cards. NVIDIA has been eating their lunch. But this week... AMD announced something that might, might. Hello, motorcycle. Anyway, uh, AMD has announced something this week that might turn this around, that might change the trend. And what that was is their Polaris range. Now, I, I was looking at some of the early performance speculations on these, and I was thinking, oh, this is going to be bad. The new AMD Radeon RX 480 has been yeah. unveiled by AMD. Now, personally, I think they should use a different numbering scheme if, because there'll be people who are going to get confused about 780, 880, 980, 1080, and, and AMD's got a 480. Oh, 40 obviously is much older. We shouldn't get that. I know. I know. It's... but. Now, let, let's start with the performance. We have not got solid benchmarks yet, but no, what... just have the in-house ones. What's been announced so far is that the RX 480 will, uh, will offer about 80% of the performance of AMD, uh, of NVIDIA's brand new GTX 1070. Um, th now, that's in the mid-range. They're not even talking about the high end of things. They're talking about it in mid-range. Now, 70%, 70 to 80% of the performance of your competitor doesn't sound like a very good thing, does it? Until you look at the price. NVIDIA is offering the GTX 1070 for somewhere in the neighborhood of $350 to $400. That's what they're considering a mid-range graphics card. AMD, with their brand new RX 480, is offering their mid-range graphics card that has 80% of the performance of, of NVIDIA's for $200. Yoink! Which means you can buy two of those for the price of the 1070. Put them together. Yeah, and go to town. Or if you're just a normal gamer who still is using a 1080 monitor, Oh my God, $200 for, for that is such a deal. That, that completely undercuts NVIDIA in the mid-range market. AMD, this is, this is AMD announcing they're going to take the market back. If these benchmarks hold up, 
NVIDIA could finally be in for a fight again. Consumers could get a price war again. This is good news for you and me, for gamers, for people who use graphics cards on PC. This is good news for us because this is competition. Yeah. It's also a uh, less power intensive card. So it'll be yeah. cooler in your PC. It'll be quieter because the fans won't be, have to be working as hard. It's still 150 watt TDP, which is not exactly the best. But in this case, you don't need the best. Yeah. It does use a little bit more power than um, the GTX 1070, but it figures out to maybe about an extra 5 to $10 per year on your power bill. It's not that bad. No. Um, how will it do in 1080? Fan-fucking-tastic in 1080. Because this thing is able to handle... Um, 1440p, which is a step up from 1080, and most people I know don't have 1440p monitors. Most everybody I know, if they're gamers, they're using 1080p. That, that's the highest resolution they're using for their monitors. This thing will murder a 1080p monitor. This will just tear right through any games at the 1080 settings with everything all turned to high. This could do Assuming it. Assuming the specs hold. Assuming the specs hold. That, that is the big caveat right now. But if this performs as promised, things are about to get really good for gamers again. For in a way that it hasn't been for well over a decade in the, the back and forth between AMD and NVIDIA. This thing, this thing is gonna be a fantastic budget card. Yes, because this is pretty much AMD claiming a massive chunk of the market and saying we're not the absolute best but you but we do really well and you can fucking afford us yeah right now in the market thanks to amd having moved the prices up 300 dollars is considered the mid-range this is amd forcing all these prices way back down now whether it'll pull the 10 1070 and 1080 prices down We'll have to wait and see. I would hope so. If it doesn't, then NVIDIA is going to be pretty much shooting itself in the foot. Because lots. this is not the kind of economy right now where people will just splash $300, $400 for a video card on a whim. But $200 is a lot more reasonable, especially if you're a PC gamer. If you've held on to your video card waiting for a while and and you need a good an upgrade, this could be a this would qualify as a solid upgrade. Yeah, and again, and again, you know, throw two of them in there with whatever their ver is is Crossfire theirs or is you, that... you're you're breaking up again. How's that? No. 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 Still static. Yeah, you got a bad cable, dude. Yeah, I must. Professionalism. Yeah, 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 yeah. How's that? Yeah, that, that, that calm now. Um. So yeah, this this could be a great thing for consumers. Could be a great thing for gamers. Could be a great thing for pretty much everybody. This is might be the start of seeing Nvidia have to compete again and competition in this market as as we just evidenced by Intel stagnating like a motherfucker. Yeah. What I don't see on this card and that's just the, the initial pictures of it is is how you do, do, do I don't see dual card connectors but it just might not be obvious. Yeah, it does do crossfire. It does do crossfire okay. so. Maybe it's those connectors at the bar at the I don't know. Yeah, for the for the price of one ten seventy, you can get two four eighties, and outpace the ten seventy. Now it'll be a fucking power hog, and it'll be noisy as shit. But if that's what you want, okay, you. But most people won't even really need. Yeah. This might be just a fantastic stepping stone to a new. Back and we need competition. Competition in this in this arena is always good. So, 
That's something to keep an eye on. We'll look for the official benchmarks once they become available, but my fingers are crossed. I really want this to be true. I miss my competitive AMD. Like nobody's business. I miss the days when AMD could compete on this shit. All right, so now it is time to answer your questions. Again, from now on, if you have questions you'd like to ask us here, you can send those to requests at radiodeadair.com. We will attempt to sort those out for you. Okay, our first one this week is kind of a common one, but I do have a bit of a, a new answer for this kind of stuff. I got this one via Twitter, actually, so um, it's, hey, Nash, hope you're well. About to replace Mobo and PC. Any tips to getting existing Windows to boot? Yes. And no. Um, let's start with, first off, you don't tell us which version of Windows you're using, so we have to go with Windows 7 and 8 and Windows 10, because there's two different answers there. Now, when it comes to Windows 7, what we're talking about here is, say you want to replace the motherboard in your computer, which is a common upgrade. Lots of people do it all the time. But the way Windows is configured, if you pull out your motherboard and put in a new one, Windows loses its shit. I hear all crackling up again, Mike. I didn't touch anything. There's a bad connector on your end. Yeah. I think that just that firewire cable is finally starting to go. You need a new one. I'm going to do that after the show. Hey, 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 it's driving me crazy. Well, they can't hear it, so just move on. Okay. All right. Well, so um, when you change out a major piece of hardware in Windows, it loses its shit for a couple reasons. Part of it is Windows activation setup. When you activate your copy of Windows, it assigns itself to the configuration of your computer, your motherboard, yes. your processor, your RAM, your video card. It looks at all these things and says, okay, this license of Windows goes to this configuration. And if it changes, it's not the same computer anymore. And this license goes away. If it changes too much, that Windows right. does let you swap out a certain number of components. Right. Now, what the other problem with this is, the way when Windows 7 and 8 starts up, it uses a lot of specific drivers that apply to a motherboard. And since a motherboard is a critical component in a computer, if those drivers are missing, and Windows it is- It can't start. Right, it can't start. It, Windows, now, yeah. I've gone through this at work. I have gone through this exact situation at work. There is a way in Windows 7 to do this. Yes. And what you do is when you boot up, you go into repair mode and you tell it, here are the additional drivers you will need. Yeah. And you load drivers until it works. Repair mode is one way. In fact, there are a couple ways to do this. Um... Oh, that was the way I did. Repair mode is one, but it's not always 100%. Now, one that, that is considered a fairly reliable one is setting Windows to what's a blank install. It pretty much tells Windows to, when, when next time it starts up... Assume no drivers. Assume no drivers and look for everything like you're, like it's a brand new system, like it's a brand new install. This is very complicated to get into. And it can really screw up some of your stuff. Yeah, there are step-by-step -step instructions on this website over here. It's called windows7easy.wordpress.com. That is Windows 7, and that's with a, the number 7, windows7easy.wordpress.com. You can go there and look up transfer your Windows 7 installation to a new PC. They have several methods here that are step-by-step -step that will show you how to do this as painlessly and easily, just simple to follow instructions, step-by-step -step to make it easy for you. And the Windows 7 method also works for Windows 8 as well. Windows 10, however, a little bit of a different situation. 
especially if you upgraded from Windows 7 or 8. Yeah. You, well, you want to explain? Okay, so if you upgrade from Windows 7 or 8, what you have is an upgrade license. And so when you try to reinstall it or try to swap motherboards, it, go, it thinks this is a brand new install and your license no longer works. What happened usually used to be if you had a product key, you just type that in and boom, boom, boom. But what when Microsoft has done with the free Windows upgrades, there's no product key. There isn't one. If you try to look for one with some of the uh, software like Jelly Bean or some of the other, you'll get a generic one. What they've done is they've tied your activation to your system's configuration. So while you will be able to swap the motherboards and everything, in order to reactivate Windows, which you'd have to do in any case if you swap motherboards, other Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10, you'd have to activate Windows again. On Windows 7 or 8, it would be easy. You just type in your product key and boom, you're good. Yeah. On Windows 10, however, since there is no product key, in order to get Windows 10 to reactivate, if you use the free upgrade, you have to call them and explain what happened, and they will activate it again. There's no automated process for this. There's no accommodation for this, which is a very common thing to do, is replacing bad components on a PC. You have to call them. You have no other option. The fuck? This is, this, this, this is, how many hundred, hundreds of millions of people are they claiming upgrade to Windows 10? How much you want to bet in the next few years this is going to become a common fucking occurrence It's just going to be a headache for consumers and for Microsoft who didn't think the fuck ahead about this? Well, we've got Windows 10 Anniversary Edition dropping and that may change things slightly. Maybe. I don't know. You did the fuck? Well, Windows 10 Anniversary drops. It's also the last time you can get your free upgrade. The Fuck the the uh, so yeah. So yes, there are ways to upgrade your motherboard and keep your Windows install. Uh, sometimes it's more pain than it's worth. Mm. It all part of it depends on how much other stuff you have installed already. Normally, the safest bet is if you're replacing something as big as a motherboard, a re a fresh reinstall is probably advisable. But you can. You can move the existing Windows. I would just, if you buy a Windows 10 product key, will you, you're fine. But most of the people using Windows 10 now did not. Unless they brought a brand new computer, most of the Windows 10 installations are free upgrades at the moment. So, uh, 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 mm. anyway. Yeah, next question. All right, John asks, I'm sure you've been asked this before, but I've been considering changing mics. I've used a Blue Snowball USB mic for my podcast. And not only have I been picking up more ambient noise than usual, but every episode has weird spikes in the waveform that can't be heard. It's about to move into a new place, though I can't spend a whole lot on a new mic, but I was wondering if you'd recommend. Use a MacBook Pro GarageBand. I have the Snowball, Snowball Ice, and a Rock Band mic considering starting voiceover work for a YouTube channel at some point, considering your background and the equipment you use, what do you think I should do with my current mic situation? This is all you, man. Well, um, do you want the bad news or the bad news, John? The, let's bad, start with the bad news. Let's start with the bad news. The bad news is you are with the snowball, the snowball ice. If you have these various mics, you're pretty much using the best thing on the low end of the price range. There's not much better you can do with for that money when it comes to a computer microphone. That that that's that's pretty much in on the low range. In order to get better sound out of your equipment, you would have to do a considerable step up. 
And that would mean shifting away from the USB mic and getting a soundboard, an XLR, phantom powered condenser microphone, and a compressor. <clears throat> that's that's the sad reality of it. Lots of people ask me, how do I sound as good as I do? And I don't sound as, as really all that great. Um, maybe a noise gate as well, or in addition, but what you're going to have to do is spend a, in order to get the most out of the out of what you have right now is buying a new mic is not going to make a, a difference. What you're going to have to do is start learning. If you're using Audacity, which most people who just can't afford anything better use, that's fine. It's a great, it's a, actually a really powerful piece of free software. Audacity is a free audio recording mixing suite that's available on the internet. Doesn't cost you a dime. Real simple to use, but you have to learn how to use it. A little bit of a learning curve. <laughs> Good news is there are a lot of free tutorials. YouTube, Google, all these places on how to use Audacity. Um, but what you're going to need to do is is make you're going to have to make the most of your post production options, which would mean um, learning how to cancel noise, learning how to deal with reverb, learning how to to do all of these things within the program itself, because you're not going to be able to do on the hardware side with a limited budget. That's that's the sad downside of all this, because with the USB, the problem with USB mics is there's no, they don't plug into a soundboard. You don't get any control. They go straight into the computer. They are a sound card unto themselves and they don't have a lot of options on them. They just record. That's it. That's it. That's all you can really do with them. The reason why a lot of people, a lot of professional streamers, they, they use soundboards is to have more control, to have more actual audio control live while things are being recorded so they don't have to deal with it in post-production. Um, but what you're going to have to do is start learning to deal with shit in post-production. Um, another thing I can recommend, it's cheap, it's janky, it's not exactly what I would call ideal, but it is a good way to help with noise cancellation and dealing with your environment. Here's what you do. You get a relatively large cardboard box. You get a quilt. You put the quilt over the outside of the cardboard box. You get some duct tape along the edges to make sure the quilt and the cardboard are pretty much right up against each other. You cut a hole in the back of the box. Shut up, Mike. <laughs> you run your cable out of the back of it underneath the quilt and you put the microphone in that box and you record, put the quilt over your head and talk into the box. This cancels out all external noise. It is absolutely the dirt cheap way of doing it. But what it will do is give you about the best audio experience you can. And if you're concerned about plosives, pop, pop, pop. Plosives, those those noises. Another dirt cheap thing to do is get a wire hanger, a coat hanger, bend it into a diamond shape. Take a pair of nylon silk pantyhose, put it over that diamond and put it in front of your microphone. That's your pop shield. Is it janky as hell? Yes. Does it work? Fuck yeah. It costs very little, but you will get really good sound quality out of the results. It's so I just I just want to make sure I understood this properly. The Nash. It is step one: cut a hole in the box. Step two: put your mic in the box. I told you not. Why? Why did you? Why? 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 Because I had to. It was there. No, you didn't. I told I you to. not to. I said no. No means no. So yeah, this the, pop filter should usually under ten dollars. Yeah, 
Yeah. But if you can't afford one, you can't afford one. You got to make fucking do. And this is how a lot of people have done it for a long time. If you can find a pop filter, go for it. But this is also a cheap way of getting it done. Um, I kind of, yeah, I actually have kind of an affinity for getting things done the cheap way. I think it's, I, I just think it's kind of cool to get it, you know. But that's me. Um, let's see. We've got about another five minutes before we, well, we'll go as long as we can. Um, let's go to Val's question here. Um. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. Is this... Oh, fuck. We'll do two more questions. We'll do two more questions. We'll run as long as we need to. Roar! Um, okay. Val says... Recently been having a lot of issues with my wireless. Oh, no, that's not it. That's the next one. Val says, my sister and I are... Listen, dear Nash and Mike, my sister and I are moving to an off-campus apartment in August. This will be the first time I'm going to be setting up a home Wi-Fi system. Now, you guys have advised against buying a router modem combo, but how do I justify the extra cost? My dad would probably just drop a Netgear router in the cart and move on. Also, based on what I've got in my apartment website, we're going to be hooked up to Comcast. Joy. Graduating next year, my sister's going to be there for the next three, and we're both Netflix junkies. Any way to make this less painful? How to justify the cost? Well, um... I would try to sell it as a security thing. But. Security is one thing, yeah. Um, but also, it's a question of getting what you pay for. I have had those damn net... Those $30 fucking Netgear Walmart routers die in under a year of use. Yeah. They are the Lexmark home printer of routers. Yeah. And pretty much what you tell your dad, look, dad, do you want to be buying another one of these again for another $30 in six months? Or do we want to do it right the first time? And get the Asus router. Because you're going to be doing do it right the first time up front, get the Asus router. Now the modem might be a little bit harder to justify for him. Now, if, you, if you're not... The, the modem might be delivered by Comcast, depending on how they have it set up in your area. Yeah. Um, I Honestly, if you're not going to be living there for a long time, you may want to just go with the Comcast modem. Make sure it's not the modem router combo. Make sure you just get one of those surfboard modems. Don't get the combo ones. They may try to force you to get a combo one. If they do... Tell them you've already got a router, you don't need the combo. If they do try to force it on you, explain to your dad that those modem router combos are... Shit. They're crap. They work badly, and they are kind of insecure, and they let Comcast turn you into a free Wi-Fi hotspot for any other Comcast user without paying you back for the electricity. Yes, Comcast does that. Isn't that nice of them? They use your router and modem combo to be a Wi-Fi hotspot for other people. It's not on your network. It's on con it's a separate network, but it uses your electricity. And they don't reimburse you for it. It's Comcastic! So uh so that pretty much the best way to explain it is. The, the difference between an upfront cost and in the long run being more expensive. And that and the the well-made routers will last you far beyond what those cheap ones will. I'm using one from uh, I got in 2012. I'm still using no 2013. I'm still using it. Yeah. It, and it's been it's rock solid. It's been rock solid for three years now going on four. It's a good it's a good Asus. Asus, Asus routers. They are they are love. Asus routers. Um, don't we should be getting paid by Asus. We should. I would love to be sponsored by them because you know I actually like their products. They they do what they said they were going to do. You use them. I use them. They, they, it's it's just a matter of it's a company that their their shit does what they say it does. If it didn't, I would upfront fucking tell you guys. I'm not getting paid by them. I wish I was. And and it's relatively user friendly when yeah. you get into the interface. Yeah. You don't want to spend under a hundred on a uh, 
on a router. That you're, you're just buying junk. All right, Unless they're having a sale on the Asus routers because the new model has come out. And they're going, oh, we got to ship the old model. <laughs> Our last one comes from Gabby. She says, Dear Nash and Mike, or it says, Hi, Nash and Mike. I've recently been having a lot of issues with my wireless. A year ago, moved in my aunt. She has AT&T. Since my room is a decent stretch from the router, my connection isn't that spectacular. I bought an Amped Wireless SR300 range extender, which worked for about half the year and I had no complaints, but then I would get DNS error upon DNS error, which I admit happens occasionally to the main router itself when I'm connected to it, but not every time, like when I get on the extender. I tried resetting both the original router and the extender and switching them both to public domain, like Google, but nothing worked. So I had a warranty, I switched up the same model, hoping to have no problems. Instead, I got a dud that wouldn't even turn on when plugged it in. So I exchanged that one as well. Same issue as the original. At this point, I barely mess with the damn thing. I'm so frustrated. Even though I've had it for at least a month, I just want something to fix this problem. Though if it is with AT&T, I can't really do anything with that because I really don't have the means of getting my own wireless service provider. I am a college kid after all. Oh, and if it helps, the DNS error was bad config and would say name not recognized. That sounds more like it's something on your machine than the repeater. Yeah. Um, my first way of testing this would be to plug your uh, computer directly into the router using a cable, using a, a RJ, uh, Ethernet cable. Um, that would be my first step to testing this. See if it still behaves the same way on a hard line as it does on wireless. Yes, Grady. Stop sneezing. I don't know. I was why about you... to ask where he was because I hadn't seen him all day. He's he's back here asleep. He's being a cat. He's a lazy little shit. Look at these. All right. I'll... Everybody wants to see Grady. Here you go. Here. Lazy little shit. There you go. Kitty. Yay. I don't think he even woke up for that. He's not even awake. He's He's still kind of asleep. I'll let him sleep. Um, so in this case, is the first thing to do is, is rule out your computer. If it's still doing the same thing with the Ethernet connector connected, you may have some other issues. Um, another thing to test is rule out your computer's wireless card. Get a cheap $10 USB wireless wireless stick. dongle. Yes, right. Plug that in and see if that solves the problem. If it does, that means your laptop's wireless card is goofing up. So, and depending on how your laptop, you, we don't have a model of your laptop here. Depending on how your laptop's configured, we don't know if it's user end user replaceable or not. So, yeah. Um, one thing I would try. Yeah. If you go to Google and from a, obviously when the computer's working and you can get to Google. Yeah. Uh, type in DNS bad config. The first link uh, should be how to fix DNS probe finished bad config error from Incredible Lab. That's the one I, I was looking at. And I, I seem to recall doing this for someone about a year ago or, or similar enough. This article looks familiar. Uh, at least the commands look familiar. And follow the commands there to see if that helps any, because you might have uh, some bad catalog information on your computer that you just need to clear out. And that might be a, a good. That Yes, that would be a simple, easy, no money fix. Those are the best ones when you don't oh, spend yeah. any money. Um, but I would think the USB stick would, would be the next thing to do. If you're still getting those issues afterwards, I don't think a range extender is going to make a difference. I honestly think you should probably upgrade to the router. And even if it's an AT&T router built in, you can shut off the built in router and get an external one that will work the exact same way and it's in fact better. And you'll have better range, which will yeah. be much nicer. Uh, and and that, that page I list, by the way, has a, a laundry list of things you can try. What was it again? So, so, so she knows. Uh, in it's uh, the Google search was DNS bad config, and it, the first one, at least on my end, was from Incredible Lab, and they go through everything, such as cleaning out your, resetting your IP and DNS, 
to changing your DNS settings, screen here. Um, testing, disabling website filters and firewalls, power cycling the hardware, which I would have made step one, but I'm pretty sure that's been covered. Yeah, that, there, there you go. That, that, that's at IncredibleLab.com. And just search for, yeah, that, that may solve it without you having to spend a penny. Here's hoping. If not, get back in touch. We'll see if we can offer more help. Well, we're running a little over time tonight. Uh, Mike, thank you very much for your assistance. Sure. We'll be back in two weeks. If you have questions for us, send those to request at radiodeadair.com. We will endeavor to help you solve your technical issues. In the meanwhile, good night, everybody. Night.